Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're chatting with Craig Hemke, founder and editor of TF Metals Report. We'll post a link in the show notes so you can visit Craig's site. Craig, we're going to do a lot in this interview to look ahead in terms of data, economic news this week, as well as some earnings this week, and even into next week with the U.S. election. But before we look ahead, let's quickly look back focused on silver. Last week was a pretty important week for silver, I think, as it finally broke above that kind of 32 resistance and just went vertical for a couple of days up to over $34. Gave back a little bit of that by the end of the week. But still, today, even trading right around that $34 level. Craig, what's the significance in your eyes of what happened with silver last week? Well, hi, guys. It's a little bit like what we saw back in, I guess, late April and May in that gold took off on March the 1st and silver kind of languished and then finally rushed to catch up. It's like everybody kind of caught on at the same time. Wait a second. The gold silver ratio is pushing toward 100 to 1. We ought to buy some silver. And then all of a sudden silver shoots up to 3250, 33 on COMEX. And then everything goes sideways through the summer. And then, as you know, gold really broke out. When was it? About, about a month ago, in early middle part of September. For me, particularly tied to that August monthly government deficit of $380 billion just for the month of August seemed to shake a lot of people up. And gold's really been on a tear ever since. And again, silver was kind of languishing and not really able to get going anywhere until it. everybody noticed that gold silver ratio was getting higher again and off it went. So now we sit in a spot here where the commitment of traders report, that positioning is a little heavy in terms of just the net positions of the swap dealing banks or the speculators, short versus long. Not a lot of shorts to be squeezed on there. So we need to have like a continuation of long interest come in to drive more buying. And that's going to come if we get a further breakout. Right now, prices settled into kind of a range, if you will, over the last five days. With about 35 at the top end and 33.50 on the low end. Whichever way it goes next will tell us a lot. And we may get some of those answers later this week. Well, Craig, as we've discussed, I think ad nauseum for the last year or two, or possibly even longer, there is a long running chart of GDX and silver. And you've put out some of this in your research that just shows the tight correlation between silver and the gold stocks and really the speculative interest in the sector. Last week, we did see GDX pop up higher, made a new 52-week high, but it still didn't take out the 2020 high yet. And But there was some animal spirits returning to the gold stocks and the silver stocks in tandem with that move in silver. Do we need to see more of that? What did you make of it? You know, Are you encouraged by what you saw last week on that side, the mining stock side? Oh, man, that friggin' Newmont is just killing it, though. You know, we've discussed this before. I remember back earlier this year before the metals really took off. Because Newmont was at 20 year lows. And, you know, the discussion was, and why even continue to hold this one when there's so many other major miners that you can hold? The problem is, it's like a bellwether stock. It's over 14% weighted in the GDX. So Newmont, you know, just takes a bath last week after their earnings and a conference call that I had several people email me after listening to it saying, this is just a disaster. This management is making fools of themselves. And so Newmont was down, what, 15% in a day? And so when that's as heavily weighted in the GDX, then the GDX is going to fall too. Now, again, for individual investors that are picking individual stocks, that doesn't really have a lot to do with things. But as a bellwether and as a, an indicator, you know, as a proxy for the sector and as a whole, you see what it does to the GDX. And so... Uh, again, I think it it implies that the individual needs to be a little more choosy. You, know, you can't just call up your stockbroker and your stockbroker ruffles through the credenza and says, oh, look, my sell side firm follows Newmont. I guess I'll recommend that one. You got to be a little more choosy. You got to do your own homework. You can't just buy a ETF that's heavily weighted in one underperforming equity. And if you do, you're doing fine. And if silver continues to go higher and gold too, then, you know, the mining shares you hold are likely to go up. It's just, boy, sure does auger, though, for someone to make sure they do their homework rather than just swallow, you know, just say, well, I'll just buy this because I heard Druckenmiller bought it, you know, that kind of thing. 
Craig, it's interesting because I talked about uh, those Newmon earnings with a couple people and the comments we got on the back of it uh, with people that are obviously focused on the gold sector were really defending the earnings, saying that it was the higher, highest kind of take home profit that the company had at close to a billion dollars for that quarter. The company's still doing well, but clearly they missed analyst expectations. Now, those expectations were raised, but I think that's also because the gold price did so well that quarter. And you consider Newmont was up 40% just in that last quarter. Did the market get this right by selling off or did we just completely miss the fact that Newmont's generating cash and that's all that should matter? Uh, Their costs is, is what's driven me away from them for so long. Is To me, it's just a bloated company with too many levels of bureaucracy and everything else that they spend money on. And so they're all in sustaining costs north of $1,600. They got the highest cost in the industry. And again, yeah, yeah, okay, it had a good quarter, but so did everything else. And now year to date, Newmont's up 15%. Okay, gold's up 30%. So where's this leverage that you allegedly get from owning a mining share? Well, it's in other ones. So I just, no one's going to move me off of the mindset I have. I don't own any, I, I own Newmont for a long time until I finally got a cold splash of water in the face back in February and said, what am I doing? But the problem is, like I said, it, it, it's the bellwether stock. And when people see Newmont go down, they think, oh man, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And with it so heavily weighted, the X now underperforms and isn't doing as well as it should be. So you're not getting even more eyes that look at this sector is really kicking rear end. No, it's being held back because of this one major equity. So anyway, I just, all of that, I, it's frustrating. But again, it does not change the fact that if you do your own homework and find good, high quality producers that do keep their costs in check and are seeing their margins widen, then you're going to be rewarded. And when they all sold off last week, just based off of the dumping in Newmont, it created some opportunities. Well, Craig, I think this is such a major point you just hit on, like in investing in the precious metals equities, because people give so much airtime to Newmont, and rightly so, it's the biggest miner. Same thing with Barrick, but there are so many other better value deals that are having better run companies, better margins, more expansion. And even if you look at the second biggest gold company now, Agnico Ego, it's just killing Barrick and Newmont as far as results and delivering. And it's got a way better margin. Look at Almos Gold. Look at Westome. There's a lot. Look at IM Gold. There, there's a lot of companies that were shooting higher. Are we in a position investing in equities where so many journalists would gravitate towards Newmont or the GDX and not do their own homework that we're at a slight disadvantage because really the best companies with the most leverage aren't in the ETFs with the heavier weighting. It's the laggards that are in there. And for some reason, people don't seem to branch out in the general sense into the companies that are actually the outperformers. Is that a problem holding the whole industry back? Well, in a way, and, and again, I don't know, I don't mean to be harsh, but it's kind of, it's just laziness and people that just don't pay attention to the sector. And so until we get to the point where it's, I guess, more of a mainstream sector to invest in, then we continue to get this, you know, picking at it by people that yeah, just kind of drive by. Well, you know, I had to get a gold stock because I see gold's going up. I read in Barron's over the weekend that gold was a good place to be in. And so then they don't know anything about it. Their advisor or whomever doesn't know anything about it. And they end up in these, like I said, these companies that I would contend are not as well run as others. So I, again, I just circle back to this again, Shad. I, it, it presents opportunity when they all get washed back because of one you know, lousy one. And that's what happened last week. And you look at the chart, even at the GDX, you can look at the chart and go, well, okay, this is a spot where I guess it could bounce. But you look at some of the others, you mentioned Egg, Nico, Eagle. I mean, we go down the list. I mean, there's, we probably, you and I could, Court could probably list off five each and not have any over, you know, overlap that are doing great, that are making a lot of money at $2,700 gold that got washed back last week and now present an opportunity if, you know, if you believe gold's going higher, you even think gold's just going sideways. So anyway, enough of that, I suppose. Look, back to the matter is these stocks are doing well and the market is still taking notice of them. But uh, your quick comment on the COT report for silver being a little heavy brings up a bigger question that I have for you is that are we seeing the Western investor take part in this rally? I've read a lot of conflicting data on this. What's your assessment? Well, again, how do you measure that, right? I mean, yes, the commitment of traders for gold, for example, let's put it that way. The commercial net short position 
for Comex Gold as of last Tuesday, six days ago, was some of the highest we've seen in eight years. And we know that back in 2016, once we got this level, price came crashing back down and really kind of fiddled around for the next couple of years after that, in 2019. So are we reaching at a point where it's extreme and overbought, if you will? Maybe, but we've been at this point before. We were at this point four weeks ago, too. We were about actually had larger positions four weeks ago, and gold has since rallied further. So in the end, it depends upon, I guess, the crux of your question, Corey. Is there enough new buying to come in? Is there enough new demand for gold futures to come in to overwhelm you know, the supply of futures coming from the swap dealers and the producers and the, you know, anybody who's still looking to hedge and that sort of thing? And that's the key. It does it can it con- continue to ha- find enough momentum? It has, you know, all the way since May as we moved higher from 2400 to 2500 to 2600 and beyond. We there needs to be that demand at least on the, for the futures contracts. Underlying all of this is still an institutional demand, a central bank demand for the physical thing itself, for the physical gold, which seems to be creating, I don't want to call it a supply shortfall or anything like that or shortages, but that demand is enough that it keeps kind of driving the, you know, a bit under the spot market too. So it I, we've not yet seen, at least I don't think we've seen, I don't sense we have outside of like, you know, the signs you see in Costco that, you know, they're sold out, you know, in 75% of their stores that have gold. I don't sense Having been at this for, you know, back during the time in 2010 and 2011, where you felt like there was a lot of regular investor excitement, I don't sense that same thing now. But again, how do you measure it? That was your question. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, you know, it's one of those things, you know, when you see it, maybe. And I'm not sure really we're seeing it just yet. Well, Craig, when you look at the factors that have been driving up the precious metals, I guess more so gold than silver, There's a lot of things people have been pointing to all year, that there's been steady central bank buying, which there absolutely has. There has been more of a focus in Eastern buying than Western buying, and trying to get a handle on when that's going to shift to the Western buying is a big focus. There's also the geopolitical uh, concerns in the Middle East and in the Ukraine, and then the political concerns around the U.S. elections. But is that all factored into gold? If some of those were to be factored out of it, uh, how much would that affect gold if we had a resolution in some of this conflict once we're past the elections? What do you make of where gold price is, the factors that are holding it up, and how things could change? Yeah, th- that's the thing about being a precious metals analyst, right? There's so many things you've got to keep track of. If you're an equity analyst in the you know utility sector, that's pretty. That's not that very complicated, right? Or retail sector, whatever. But man, when you follow gold, it is, everything impacts gold. And so there are all these different variables, you know, interest rate. I mean, look at what's happened this year with interest rates. You know, the ten, yield on the 10-year note spiking and then coming down and then spiking again. The dollar index spiking, coming down and then spiking again. And yet gold has continued to chug along. Maybe the one factor that comes to my mind, Shad, that I think is really kind of underlying this, you know, it's central bank demand, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I have the one thing that I think is this growing recognition that the U.S. fiscal situation is reaching in a point where it's uh, very difficult to manage. You know, we just wrapped up fiscal year 2024. The U.S. fiscal year runs from October 1 to September 30th. So we just ended our fiscal year. We just started a new one. And the total U.S. deficit was $1.83 trillion. Interest paid on the existing debt was $1.13 trillion. Like I said, anybody can pull up the chart, go back to September the 9th, and look at how gold has traded since then. And that was the day that the statement for August came out showing a $380 billion deficit for just the month of August alone. And I think that is underlying just a real consistent bid for all things precious metal, whether it's futures contracts or spot metal or ETFs or you name it. I think that's the thing that's driving it. And because that's not a reversible thing, you know, all of a sudden a war can be fixed, you know, or all of a sudden the in, you know, unemployment rate comes down, all, you know, things that are reversible. But this debt exponential cycle is not reversible. Neither party's talking about it. Doesn't matter who wins the election, nobody is, is working to solve this problem because it's probably unsolvable. And so I think that maintains a bid under this 
and which is why you just keep seeing this series of higher highs and higher lows, and we haven't seen it top out yet. No, man, it's been a very strong move and a very consistent move. It's a move that I really like to see here where it has been two steps forward, maybe a one or half of a step back, and then some more buying coming in. This is the chart pattern that you want to see. But Craig, in terms of catalysts over the next couple of weeks, boy, oh boy, we have a lot of economic data. We have central bank meetings. We also have the U.S. election. Take us through what you have your eyes on most. Oh, good heavens. This is going to be a busy week. As we record this on Monday, nice, quiet day. But Tuesday, you get the latest job openings and quits data called the JOLTS data. Comes out at 10 o'clock Eastern. And that always moves things. It moves the bond market, which then in turn moves the dollar and, the, and foreign currency markets. And then gets the algos to move the precious metals. And we get into Wednesday. We get the first guess at Q3 GDP at 8.30 in the morning Eastern. Well, that's going to move things. I'll move all those components again. And then we get into Thursday and we get, you know, the Fed meeting is next week. The last indicator of what inflation is at the retail level we get on Thursday with the PCE, personal consumption expenditures. That's always reported as the Fed's favorite inflation indicator. So we get that on Thursday and Friday. Again, drawing attention to the fallacy of what's supposed to be an accurate representation of how many jobs the U.S. added in October on Friday, the 1st of November. At 8.30, before the day even starts, we get the latest jobs report. So you're supposed to believe on Friday, the 1st of November at 8.30 in the morning, we already know exactly how many jobs were created in October, but whatever. Everybody knows how that's going to move things. We get it next week. The election is on Tuesday. The Fed meeting concludes, I think on Thursday. Thursday. I don't think it's Wednesday. I got to make sure I know, obviously. Man, it's going to be a busy couple of weeks. And uh, by the time, I know we're not going to speak next week. So by the time we talk again in early November, I'd be very curious to see <laughs> what gold prices have done. Yeah, Craig, it's going to be interesting to see what happens post-election, if we even have a winner and how long it takes to decide that. And it's going to be a, a wild ride for sure. One other thing that happened, though, I wanted to get you to reflect on it, is that we did finally get the BRICS meetings overseas, and 30 other countries decided they wanted to join, and I don't think they're going to let them all in at once. But one thing that came out of it that's getting a lot of airtime, and I'd love you to weigh in on it, is the cross-border payment system that they've come up with. And so I think they're still working out the details, but it's people think it could be a boon for precious metals. They also think it could be a negative situation with the U.S. dollar. What did you make of this cross-border payment system from the BRICS meeting? Well, that's all part of what's coming. I mean, we've been talking about this really since 2008 or 9. You know, as soon as, you know, the U.S. cut and the Western financial system kind of got pantsed by the great financial crisis, you know, these other countries that rely on the U.S. dollar as reserve currency for trade and for their foreign currency reserves went, whoa, wait a second, hold on a minute. We ought to, maybe we ought to, be paying attention to what's going on here. And then, of course, that's all has been accelerating over the last decade. And then the confiscation of Russia's foreign currency reserves and kicking them out of SWIFT in March of 2022 kind of sped the whole process forward. But it's an incremental thing. I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, boy, this BRICS meeting, watch out for headlines. Well, well you know, at some point there will be headlines, but it didn't necessarily have to happen as a completed process last week. They're moving in that direction. To create any kind of currency, just like how the U.S. dollar became reserve currency in 1944 because the U.S. had the gold and you could redeem the dollar for gold. And that gave people confidence in using it. Any new currency that would be used to supplant that or in place of that will probably have some kind of gold backing. Just again, to get the user's confidence, give the user's confidence. And so that day is coming. It's not necessarily a remonetization of gold, but it's a reemphasizing of how gold is a significant financial asset, and that's good for all of us. So anyway, the fact there wasn't some, you know, massive headlines out of that BRICS conference, that, that, that didn't surprise me. I wasn't expecting them, but I think everybody needs to know the ram and understand the ramifications of a world gradually shifting its emphasis away from only using the U.S. dollar, primarily using the U.S. dollar for foreign currency reserve, for foreign currency trading or, or for trading between countries. What that does that recre that decreases demand for dollars. At the same time, as I was mentioning with this deficit numbers and debt numbers, the supply of dollars is increasing. And in any good, doesn't matter what it is, Econ 101, increasing supply, 
with a decreasing demand means a lower price, and that will be for the dollar as well. Lastly, I, I just should double check so everybody hears correctly. The Fed meetings usually start on Tuesday and conclude on Wednesday. This next meeting next week for one time only will start on Wednesday and conclude on Thursday. So just kind of a heads up on that. All right. Hey, Craig, great chatting with you. You're right. It is a process when you talk about any changes in kind of global currency functioning. But boy, oh boy, do we hear it all the time that the world's going this other direction and it's happening tomorrow. It's happening at this meeting. I think we've been around this sector long enough to know that's not exactly how it works. But hey, there does seem to be a process. So we'll see how that all continues. It's something for us to talk about. Great chatting with you. Thank you very much for your time. Again, Craig Hemke, founder and editor of TF Metals Report. We'll chat again in another couple of weeks. Craig, have a great rest of your week. You too, guys. We'll see you in two weeks.